So last week we started a sermon series that I, I decided to call Keep Pushing Forward. And I will explain really what that means outside of the obvious that when we're faced and met with opposition, um, we fail when we quit. You don't fall because you get knocked over. You don't fall because you lose a battle here and there. We fail when we quit. And one thing, I just don't believe in quitting like that. I believe that, well, I say it all the time, I'm never down. I'm never down. I'm either up or I'm getting up. Come on now. But, but I'm not going to stay down. I'm going to get back up and, and, and keep fighting because we fail when we decide to quit. Can I get an amen? So yes, we want to keep pushing forward through everything. But I, I wanted to do uh, more diligence, have more diligence towards this idea opposed to just get everybody all revved up about just keep pushing forward. No, I want to look in the Word and let the Word show us what pushing forward really is because it's really awesome. And so, yes, we, we're, going to, we're going to be looking at the life of Joseph uh, over the next couple of weeks because within his life, uh, the story of Joseph, there's so many principles and, and valuable things that we can pull out of his character. He was not a perfect man, but he really demonstrated a, a great integrity and great character that should become a great role model for all of us that are looking to maybe improve in a few areas. And, uh, and so we, we, we uh, started this this last week. My grandson's trying to call me, and all of a sudden he's coming through my phone or my iPad over here. He's just going to have to wait. I, I apologize. I forgot to turn that off. Um, and so last week we talked about uh, the word prosper or prosperity or, or prosperous. And, and yeah, I wanted to bring a balance to what that word really means, especially in today's ministry, because there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, temptation out there to chase after what the world has, has termed prosperity. And instead of the church influencing society, society finds a way to influence the church. And, and so we're, we're always kind of battling. Like when Jude wrote in, in the book of Jude, he was really trying to talk about keep the world out of the church. We're really supposed to take the church into the world to affect change in the world, but we need to keep that influence out of the church because the worldly influence is never going to be driven by God. It's always going to be driven by the God of the world of which He's overcome and we have to continually to speak and stand over. And I'm talking about the enemy of the body of Christ. I'm talking about Satan himself. And so we, 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 we don't want the world to come and influence how we function in the church. We've been guilty of that in the past. And, and the word prosperity is one that has been absolutely abused, absolutely taken advantage of, manipulated, misunderstood. And I tried to show you last week that the word prosperity doesn't include just money. Uh, it it's really has very little to do with finances. And it has everything to do with what God is doing within us. And so we looked at the life of Joseph, the early parts of his life, where he was obviously very favored by his father uh, to the point to where in his immaturity, he boasted in a few areas about, about his gift. There's no doubt that God had equipped him to, uh, to have dreams and interpret these dreams, okay? Um, and in his immaturity, he shared these dreams with his brothers, but was not able to give them a more clear understanding, and they took offense to it, because in his dreams, he was always the, the hero or the point of worship in these dreams. Even his father, who loved him dearly, rebuked him uh, at a certain point because of the way these dreams were being conveyed. And it, so we see that his brothers took opportunity in Genesis chapter 37, chapter 38, and chapter 39, when, when Joseph is sent to check on his brothers, he was being obedient to his father, his brothers saw him coming from afar off, and they, they devised a plan to get rid of him. Uh, it was by the grace of God and the mercy of God that his life was spared. H had Reuben not stepped up and found a, a creative way to, to possibly spare his life, they would have killed him and brought the evidence to the father. But God had a plan. 
And so, uh, yeah, they, they, they stripped him of his coat. They threw him in a pit. They fabricated a lie, told his father that a wild beast killed him. They sold him off to some travelers who happened to take him down to Egypt. In chapter 39, the first six verses, we saw how a man named Potiphar, who was the, the chief captain of the guard for Pharaoh, for the temple, for the whole area, he was a man of great standing status. He, he had authority. Well, he, he buys Joseph as a servant and brings him into his house. But he sees something different about Joseph that, that we've come to learn. It was the favor of God. The word said that Joseph, this was a servant. Uh, another word for it is slave. Uh, he, he was a piece of property that was being traded now for finances. And so this piece of property in the eyes of the world the Bible said he was a successful man. And I questioned that last week of why that, why word it that way? How could he show success when he had nothing to his own name, but yet he himself was a piece of property that had been exchanged now two different times, and now he's a servant in a house when he brought none of this on himself? And the idea was he had to keep pushing forward because the Bible has called him a prosperous man. And that word prosper, way more times than, than not, that word prosper literally means to push forward. To push forward. When, when we talk about the prosperity, God, God takes prosperity in His servants. I showed you last week that had nothing to do with money, that that word prosperity in the Scripture is the word shalom, that, that God takes a great pleasure in the peace which is within His servants. That peace is part of us being prosperous when we have a great peace and a joy. It doesn't matter what the world throws at us. It doesn't matter what we're facing we're going to be prosperous in everything we put our hand to. Can I get an amen? We're going to keep pushing forward. And we see, not just last week, but today we're going to see a different aspect of this. And we're going to see next week how every time he's, Joseph is met with resistance or a hurdle or some kind of calamity or trial, that what he does is, is he continues to show his, his prosperity because he keeps pushing forward no matter where he's at. And it had nothing to do with money. It had nothing to do with materialistic possessions. Unfortunately, we've turned it into that. And I'm here to tell you that I have no problem whatsoever with somebody being financially blessed. Not what That's between you and God. Amen? But I, I do not see that that's perpetuated as the goal that God has for all of us to make us all filthy rich. I'm sorry, you're going to see today there, there's a real hurdle in that. Are y'all still with me today? And so I would like to, to uh, pick up today part two of what, what, what I want to talk about in Keep Pushing Forward, uh, knowing that we talked about being prosperous means to push forward. Uh, I, I want to talk about another way that we have to learn to push forward and, and what we're going to have to push forward through. And we're going to use an example from Joseph here in just a minute. But I, I want to really talk to you today about temptation. And, and I'll, I'll bring this together in just a few minutes. Temptation. T temptation is an important word for us to understand. Temptation really is something that affects everybody in this room at one level or another. And I'm going to tell you, not on a yearly basis, not on a monthly basis. I'm going to just tell you, I think temptation is something that we face every day different levels. And I want to show you that pushing forward in Scripture isn't just when negative stuff happens to you. We're going to see Joseph. He prospered through temptation. He pushed forward through temptation because he took a, a, a spot that he knew he was supposed to stand. And that, that was a spot of great integrity and great character and great virtue. And he stood on that ground. And there were moments he had to push through the temptation to keep that piece of ground. And I look at the life of Joseph. I'm going to point a few things out to you today. And I know that in my life and everybody else's life in here, 
We've all been faced with these, what the world is going to call opportunities, but I'm going to show you these are trials or a test that we have to learn to pass. If you find yourself listening to this today and you, you, you arrive at the conclusion of, I've failed every test the last month, please, today is not about condemnation or shame. Today is about giving yourself an opportunity to stand in repentance and make sure that from this point forward, we start passing these tests. Can I get an amen? I'm in a room full of God-fearing saints that believe in Jesus Christ, I hope. Amen? But I'm also in a room full of people that have made a bucket load of mistakes. But we're not here on account of our mistakes. We're here because we've got the blood of Jesus working in our favor. We've got the Spirit of God living within us. You may have walked in this room literally walking in defeat in a few areas. That is not how we can leave today. Today we have opportunity to leave refreshed. I mean, absolutely forgiven for everything and on a new path if we will hear what he's trying to teach us. Can I get an amen? Amen. This is really good preaching, Pastor. I, I want to thank you for that word, Pastor. Yes, sir. I'm kidding. I'm, 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 just, I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I believe there should be a great joy in church, and I'm happy to be in church. Amen. Temptation. Let me just give you a couple scriptures just to give you an idea of what Jesus, what, what, what Paul, what, what the Holy Spirit has uh, encouraged us about this temptation, Jesus, in Matthew chapter 26, and verse 41. He literally said, Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The Spirit indeed is willing. And here's where an axiomatic truth, here's where a, a caution comes out. Here's, here's where... He is literally trying to encourage us to listen to what he's about to say because he's about to tell us something about us that we need to learn. He said the spirit is willing. The whole idea is temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And the world keeps wanting to tell us how and where we need to function in the church by our feelings. If it feels good, do it. You know, okay, remove God out of the picture for just a second and just listen to logic. Logically, th th that sounds okay. If it feels good, do it. I, I don't want to do anything that hurts. Uh, you know, if, if something brings pain, I'm going to avoid it. I, I want to do something that feels good. There's, there's nothing wrong with that specific idea unless you apply the whole purpose being God being the factor, when we allow ourselves to operate on feelings alone or if feelings is the rudder that directs our lives, then we're going to live and die based upon our feelings. And if we've all understood anything, our feelings can change in the moment. Amen. I wake up and you're feeling good and let yourself step on a Lego left on the floor and your feelings going to change. And if we continue to make life decisions, spiritual decisions based upon our feelings, no wonder society says the church is crazy. Because the church can't make up their mind what we're going to believe or where we're going to stand or how we're going to act. We cannot function on our feelings because the flesh is weak. Amen. And we're talking about temptation here on all kinds of levels. Obvious, the Bible is going to take us to the extreme, to the most dangerous, but this is applicable on every temptation at every level. The flesh is weak. Please don't think that you have it. Please don't think you've got it. The flesh is weak, and the flesh can fail. That's why Paul, in Romans chapter 7, gives us the most confusing, frustrating portion of scripture in the Bible. When Paul, who taught us what faith is supposed to be, Paul, who brought the idea of what righteousness is in Christ, where you ought to stand, Paul said, man, there's days when I feel like doing it, I don't feel like doing it because my flesh says to do it, and I don't want to do it because I'm confused. I just want to take Romans chapter 7 and just pull it out of the Bible and say, I, I just can't make sense of it, but I, I won't do that, because what Paul's really doing is he's literally talking to the flesh. 
There are days when he's in spirit, man, he's ready to fight the fight, but his flesh is weak. And, and he's got to, this really kind of goes hand in hand, he's got to mentally overcome the flesh by what's going on in his mind. And that's where the battle's at. Amen? And, and so we're talking about don't allow yourself to arrive at a spot where you think you stand. I've got scripture for you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 11. We're out of water bottles, so I had to steal my wife's drink. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 11. Listen to this. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, anytime we, we, we do uh, uh, communion and we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 to, to get instruction for uh, observing the Lord's table, we really don't need to, to separate chapters 11 and chapter 10 because 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is this wonderful insight where Paul is using what the children in the wilderness went through, where God brought them out of bondage, was taking them into the land of promise, but yet they kept rejecting God and doubting God and disobeying God in that wilderness. And that quick journey turned into a lifetime for those that perished out there in the wilderness. And I'm here to tell you, that was not God's plan, that they go out there and die in the wilderness. God's Thank you. God's plan was that they carry over quickly into what He had promised, but yet because of their doubt, their disobedience, and, and, and their, the way they were focusing on things is what I'm going to get to, you, to here in a second. Yeah, they, they failed out there in the wilderness. Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he literally gives us a breakdown of this, and he says right here in verse 11, he says, now all these things, speaking of the children in the wilderness, all these things happen to them as examples, and they, are, they were written for our admonition, uh, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Listen to what he's saying here. Paul is saying, all of what we have by way of Old Testament history really is an example of how you operate in faith, but also what not to do in doubt and disobedience. Because what happened to them became an example for us that we admonish one another, exhort one another to not make those mistakes. Can, can I get an amen? And then he says, listen to this. He says, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. That word stands means be established. We're talking about pride now. We're, we're talking about one of the biggest hurdles we have to overcome in our world today. Man's biggest hurdle man has ever had to overcome from day one to today you think about the, the biggest movements that are going on in society, what drives those movements? What is that flag all about? We want to focus on the sin. And I'm trying to tell you, we need to focus on the root of the sin. The sin is not the problem. The root of the sin is the problem because it's all based around pride. Are y'all with me this morning? And we want to throw hurls and, or hurl insults at them because they, we see an obvious sin in their life. And I'm sitting here saying, wow, I think every one of us have had to overcome the same thing that they need to overcome so they can be delivered. Pride. Are y'all hearing me? Pride from the very beginning. We have to overcome pride, our own pride. Paul says it right here. He says, be careful, those of you that think you're established. They think you've arrived. They think you're somebody. Be very careful lest you fall. Are y'all hearing me today? There's, a, there's none of us. There's not one of us that aren't vulnerable to falling into this trap of pride and failure. Can I get an amen? Then he says in verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except, that su except such as which is common to man. But God is faithful. By the way, that no temptation that's common to man, that's pride. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Yeah, I could actually preach an entire sermon series on those few verses right there. 
because there's such a misconcept that's in, in people's minds today. You find yourself going through a bad situation and, and, and maybe, maybe you caused it, maybe you didn't, but in the middle of that bad situation, we're doing things that we know we're not supposed to do, and then we say stuff to one another to, to relieve our own guilty conscience. Well, God, God wouldn't put this on me if I couldn't go through it. No, that's not what the Scripture said. The Scripture didn't say God's going to make you have sin because he'll, he'll, He won't let you get carried away with that sin too far because He, he won't put too much on you that you can't handle. No, that's not, that's not even in the Bible. That's, that's a false teaching. God's not going to allow you to, to, to sin to a certain point because He knows what you can handle and what you can't handle. Anybody ever heard that, that bad doctrine being taught before? That's not what He said. He said He won't allow you to be tempted beyond what you can handle. But even in the middle of that temptation, He's going to give you a way out. Come on. <laughs> you, you know, th this message is liberating on one side, but it's incriminating on the other. Because with that word, if you're going to be a student of the word, that, that scripture right there literally just took this responsibility out of God's hands and put it in your lap. Amen. D temptation is a danger to all of us. And, and if we're going to promote anything in the body of Christ, we need to keep raising that standard and encouraging one another to do, do not fall to the temptation that may be, be before you. Stop looking at things like they're opportunities. Play it out and see where it goes, and you're probably going to find out it's nothing more than a test that you don't need to be a part of, that you need to pass that test and push through in the name of Jesus. Can I get an amen? Amen. Oh, I got another one for you. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Here's another scripture that is misunderstood in the world. But this is a big, big temp temptation. This is a big worm on a hook that lures a lot of people to chase after this, and what they find is not what they were looking for. Verse 9, verses 9 and 10, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Those who desire to be rich, yeah, you know, that's, I'm, I'm not picking on money. I don't have a problem with money. I, are y'all hearing me? I do not have a problem with money. I, I have a problem with what it leads to. Because I've, we, we've seen this in almost every situation. Those who desire to be rich. Yeah, that opens the door. Unless they have the true godly character that it's going to take to stand on a platform like that, then they're going to fall right here the way Paul speaks it. This is God warning the body of Christ. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Remember that word snare here in just a second. And into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed the, from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. He said it's the, the, the pursuit of, of riches Opens the door to temptation and snare. Now, I've given you three different scriptures just in the New Testament, and I just want to tell you what the definition of the word temptation is to, to show you that I'm not reaching to, to, to give you a sermon about the great test that may be before you today. The word temptation in almost every example is the definition. It means a putting to proof, or it means an experiment. That's what the definition is. Or it means a trial. The best word that I can come up with, it's a test. It's a test. And when we pursue anything but God, we're going to step into an arena where we're probably going to be tempted. And what's lying right behind temptation is the fulfillment of the flesh. Think about every major ministry that has fallen in the last 20 years. How did they fall? They failed because there was no accountability at the top. There was great riches coming in. And with great riches and no accountability, 
in every instance, not some, in every instance, there's this passion and this desire for the flesh to be fulfilled, the lust, the appetite. It's a recipe for destruction when there's no accountability. And it starts with temptation. Temptation is a snare. It's a trial. It's, a, it, it's an experiment to see just how far one is willing to go. We know where temptation comes from. God does not tempt us. God does not tempt us into sin. Anybody that has taught you that God tempts you into sin, you need to run from them as fast as possible. You at least need to close your ears when they're talking. God is not the one that tempts us into sin. He's the one that says, stay away from it. Amen. Are y'all with me this morning? Now listen to this. We're going to go back to Joseph. I just want to give you just a couple of scriptures, and I want you to see something in his life. Now, in verses 1 through 6 last week of chapter 39, we saw how he ended up in Potiphar's house, and even Potiphar, he was like, God, there's something different about this guy. All of a sudden, I have a blessing that's on my home, on my life, that I didn't have before this Hebrew kid came into my, my phone. So what did he do? He elevated him into his household. He made him, I mean, in charge of everything. He, he turned everything over, him, over to him to the point to where I showed you last week that Potiphar was like, you know what? I don't even know what's going on except for what I want to eat today. You have control of everything. That's how much he believed in the blessing that was taking place because of this prosperous man in his home. And, and, and I want you to see how verse 6 ends up to lead us in to verse 7. The very last part of verse 6. Can you, Aaron, can you bring up Genesis chapter 39, verse 6? Genesis chapter 39, verse 6. Is he sitting there, Brad? Because I can't see him. I got the screen there. All right. Thus, he, this is speaking of Potiphar about Joseph. Thus he left all he had in Joseph's hand, and he did not know what he had except for the bread which he ate. That's, that's some serious trust right there. Yeah, I mean, think about this for just a second. He is the captain of the guard. He's the guy that oversees all of the execution and punishment. He has great responsibility and great authority. You don't arrive in that spot because you're careless about things in life. You arrive at that spot because you're pretty diligent yourself with handling details. You know, little details like putting somebody to death. I mean, this, is, this is important. And so he, he's not going to foolishly turn his household over to somebody out of ignorance. No, he must have really seen something significant. There must have been a major shift from the time that Joseph showed up to the time that he thought, you need to be the one running this show. Are you guys hearing me? Why? Because Joseph was blessed. Joseph was prosperous. Joseph, according to Scripture, was a successful man. How? Well, obviously, whatever he put his hand to, the father found a way to move forward. Potiphar saw it, okay? And so he turned everything. Oh, just worry about what I'm going to eat. What's for dinner tonight, guys? Everything else is in his control. Am I the only one that gets a little comic humor out of this? It's a wonderful moment. I would really love for my life to be just so set up where I just, Renee, what's for dinner? And let everybody else worry about the rest. Amen. I am envious of Potiphar just to a point, to a point. That's a joke. I, I want you to, to notice the very last thing in verse 6 because I think verse 6 is a lead in to, to 7. It's not like Joseph was hard on the eyeballs. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Okay, not only was he blessed and successful, he was obviously pretty easy on the eyeballs. Right? And that, that always aids in stuff. Amen. Are y'all with me? All right. Because I think, I think this is how our, our world functions today. I, I think our world functions based upon what we see and we feel. And if it's beautiful, we're all in. If it's not so beautiful, we'll find a way to not be in. Amen. Are y'all with me? I'm just, I'm just giving to you the, the facts. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let's look at verse 7. We're talking about temptation today. 
We're talking about keep pushing through, not just in bad moments, but keep pushing through even in the moments of temptation. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, lie with me. But he refused. Father, I pray that we would receive verse 8 and verse 9. I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to be upon us right here in this moment that we could grasp this truth, maybe perhaps like never before, in Jesus' name. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in this house, and he's committed all that he has to my hand. There's great character being displayed right here. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept anything back from me but you, because you are his wife. And then he makes a statement that we, we need to adapt and to adopt into our lives and understand this is a beautiful place to stay right here. And here's what he said. <clears throat> How then can I do this great wickedness <clears throat> and, again, and sin against God? He said, How can I do this? It's, it's not just because, man, I don't want to lose my spot. I've earned this. I've worked my way up into this. No, no, no. no that's, that's really not what was driving it. Why? Well, look, I'm man number one around here, and you're, I'm just not going to do... No. The, it, the root of why he was prosperous to begin with is what is being modeled right here. Her eyes were longing in lust after him. She's, he was well on the eyes. She saw it, she knew it, and she wanted it. That's what the Scripture said. And so plan was in motion. She was going to get what she wanted. And she approached him. And she even made the offer. I'm just going to tell you right now, in today's culture, in today's world, this right here, what he says, how, how would I dare do this wickedness? It's a sin against God. What he called wicked and sinful, I'm just going to be honest with you. In the body of Christ today, do you know how many Christians today would not see that as wicked and sinful? Do you know how many Christians today would see that as opportunity? I'm sad to say. They, they wouldn't look at, wait a minute, that would make me breaking covenant. That would make me a liar, a hypocrite. Not to mention, I would dishonor myself before God and dishonor you. No, we would look at it as opportunity. Ah, oh, man, the man's wife wants me? Are you kidding me? I must be somebody. Are y'all hearing me? It, oh, that, oh, and then, of course, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5 begins to play out. We, what, what we, like we talked about Wednesday, when the thought even enters in, if we don't cast that thought down, then all of a sudden we, we start making an argument. Well, you know, I, I am pretty important. I'm so important, I'm pretty sure if I got caught, Potiphar wouldn't really be that mad because I'm a blessing to his household and I'm not really hurting anybody else. It's just me and her. I'm sorry, bad grammar. It's just her and I. And, 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 and before you know it, we're, we're, we're no longer just not casting down the thought. Now, now, and we've gone past the argument against the knowledge of God. Now we're, we're really imagining this thing and we're dreaming this thing. Are y'all hearing me? Wait, bad grammar. Are you hearing me? Do you, do you see the, the snare, the trap, the temptation? He, he, he could have reasoned a number of ways of why this is an opportunity. Why? Well, because that's what people with no character do. That's what people who don't understand who they are in Christ will do. And God has not called us to continue operating in those realms of failure. God has called us to stand on principle and understand who it is. It wasn't about him losing his spot. It was about him sinning against God. The whole purpose he was, or the whole reason he was blessed to begin with is because he had character before God. He was prosperous because he trusted God. Are you guys hearing me today? How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Verse 10. And so it was, she, as she spoke to Joseph day 
by day that he did not heed her to lie with her and be with her. So we fast forward. We're going to catch a couple things next week. I, I, I'm, I'm going to shut my story down right there at this point to make another point to you and, and speak to this and then we'll, we'll be done. But, but we know that, that she eventually lies to her husband and, and gets him thrown into prison and we see God working through him at a different level, okay? And, and so this is, what you're seeing here is not failure just because he was doing something right, just because we're called to do something right, doesn't always mean everything's going to go in our favor all the time. He did what was right. It wasn't a moment. It was day by day. What, he had to keep pushing forward every day. Every day. He had to keep pushing forward. He could not let his guard down. He could not lower his character. He had to maintain every day to be who he was called to be. He was met with the same temptation every day. Every day. Are you guys hearing me? Pushing forward isn't just, man, I'm sick and tired of that bad situation. Pushing forward a lot of times is us saying, I'm not going to fall to the temptation today. I'm, I'm going to overcome today. It's not going to get me today. It didn't get me yesterday. It didn't get me the day before. It didn't get me the day before that. It's not going to get me tomorrow. It's not going to have me today. Are y'all hearing me today? This, this is what character of God is all about. He stood on his principle and he kept pushing forward as a prosperous man because he was not going to succumb to her. Why? It wasn't about losing his position. It was about not sinning against God. The whole, the whole reason he was prosperous as I showed you last week, is because he was open to the presence of God in his life. I'm sorry, church. This is not about condemnation right now. This is not about having made mistakes. This is about patterns now. Bitter water and sweet water are not supposed to come from the same pouch. Okay? The same faucet cannot give bitter water sweet water. You, you, God has called you. He, he has sent His Son to die for you. You you receive this. You begin to walk in His righteousness. You start confessing as a Christian. We have no room in our life to keep going back to sinful nature. We pick a direction with God and we need to keep pushing forward with God no matter what the temptation. I just want to give you a couple scriptures about this. It said here, she was obviously being driven by temptation he was a good-looking guy. I mean, amen, right? And, and, and that was obviously appealing to her. She saw it. She wanted it. And she was putting her plan in place. We see moving forward that she even pushed to a day where she had appointed that all the other servants were not going to be in the house. Potiphar was off at some festival or feast or whatever scholars have said he was doing. He wasn't around. The servants weren't around. She had orchestrated it where Joseph was going to be alone with her, and then she moved her plan to the next stage. Okay? Yeah, let me just give this to you right now. I'm just going to throw this out here for just a second because this will eliminate a lot of stuff. If you are not married to or related to the opposite sex, do not be in a room alone with them. I need to say that a little louder. Especially if you're a married man or married woman, do not get alone with another man or woman, married or not. Because you don't even want to give way to the temptation. Amen. Amen. We could, we could remove, uh, eliminate, I mean, the majority of the failure we see in relationships if we could just operate on that standard. If somebody from the opposite, opposite sex must talk to you, telephone or spouse next to you. Don't get alone with them. Are y'all hearing me today? Please. You have to protect you. Amen. 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 Somebody comes into my office that I'm not married to, and I've only got one of those, by the way, okay? That door's wide open. And there's been many times, you may have been offended at me by this. Please don't be offended. It's not you. Uh, I'm just, I'm going to protect what I have here. But there's been times that somebody has just come right into my office because the door's open and started a conversation. And I don't want to be rude, so I get up out of my desk, and I'm standing by the door, waiting for somebody to come around the corner. I'm not being rude to you. 
I just don't want anything to happen to us. Amen. 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 Are y'all hearing me today? Protect what God has given you. Amen. Because the enemy, he's got a plan. She, here's, she, she had these longing eyes. Starts with the eyes. Oh, we, we, oh my goodness, if we could just understand the value of what you're going to hear here. Here, here. It starts with the gateway of the eyes. The eyes. I'm going to show you in Scripture. I'm almost done. Am I helping anybody? Psalm chapter 103, or I'm sorry, 101 verse 3. Impurity begins in the eye and not the heart. Don't look. <laughs> Looking leads to lusting. Lusting leads to longing. And I'm sorry, longing leads to losing. Psalm 101 verse 3. He said, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. This starts with us. We have a conscious, conscious choice to make. Are you going to put it before you or not? If it presents yourself without you making the decision, then turn your head. Now listen, when, Romans, when Paul said in Romans chapter 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourself holy and pleasing before God. This is your reasonable service. Because God is not, you know, it's, the battle is right here in the mind. Notice in those verses, he, he, he literally talks about your spirit is cool with God. Your soul is, there's a war going on, but your decision is based upon in your flesh. That's really what he's summing up. You have the, the choice whether you're going to present your body a living sacrifice before God or not. You do. God's not going to force you into submission and bring you down to the altar and make you sacrifice your body. God's not going to mess with free will. Amen. He, he's left that in the arena for us to use. Free will. Are you going to do it or not? And that's what Paul is saying. He said, don't be conformed to this pattern you see before yourself, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have a choice. If something presents itself to you, you literally have to make the decision. Are you going to keep looking at it? Or are you going to turn your head? Now, we, we were sitting in, in, a, in, a, in a pastor's conference one time, and we were walking over this scripture, and the gentleman teaching the scripture, he, he even went as far as to say, this is where God gave man the neck. He said, you present yourself holy and pleasing before God, for when something you know, is, is tempting you, you can turn your head. Use your neck. Turn your head. He gave you the ability to swing your head for a reason. He said, besides, when you make the decision to not look at something that could lead you into temptation and then lust and then longing where you lose everything, he said, when you make the decision to turn your head, God sees that as something that is pleasing to Him. Because now you are now sacrificing the flesh. What you could have had in the flesh, you are now sacrificing that to God. And He says, that's pleasing. So, so we said in this, this, this conference, and, and we left that conference like 10 minutes later, went to lunch. Pastor and I, well, a friend of mine, we, we went in first to get the seats for everybody that was going to be in, in that lunch meeting. Fresh out of this teaching. Walked into the restaurant. The, the, the young lady that was greeting us, she, don't know what was going on in her life, but she left almost nothing left to an imagination on what was underneath because the way she dressed herself. And she was... Not hard to look at. I'm just being honest with you. And I knew it, and he knew it. Oh, wait a minute. We just talked about this in our conference. And I turned my head as he turned his to me, and he said, do you smell that, God? Do you smell it? Does it smell good to you? Because it was an aroma that was pleasing to God. Because in that moment, we decided, I'm not going to be tempted. I'd rather look at my ugly pastor friend Amen. Uh, uh, opposed to, especially 10 minutes after we walk through that, to keep looking at something that's going to lead me into temptation. Why? God gave us a neck. That's why the psalmist said, don't even put these things before your eyes. And if it shows up without you making the decision to put it there, turn your head. Get your eyes off of it. Can I get an amen? Okay. I'm going to say this, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 20. I just want you to understand. 
We're talking about the lust of the flesh not ever being satisfied. It always leads to destruction. And Proverbs said, hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of man are never satisfied. The flesh is weak. Who do you think you are that you're going to stand in this thing? No, the flesh is weak. You need to battle against this and don't even put yourself in this position. And the very last verse I want to share with you today comes from Jesus himself. Verse, Matthew chapter 6, verse 22 and verse 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Can I just pray with you this, this afternoon? I just, I'm going to pray a prayer of repentance. That you, you just pray along with me. And in your heart, if you'll just surrender this area to God, when we leave here today, whatever the enemy intends to lead us astray with, I pray that the Holy Spirit will remind you, you have a choice. You have a choice. The flesh is weak. And so therefore, let's protect the flesh so that we don't step into this temptation. This is how we push forward. We've got to keep pushing forward by fighting the flesh. Amen? And I know everybody in this room has failed this test from one time or another. Today's not about condemning or, or guilt in that. Today's saying we're going to strengthen ourselves from this day forward. Have I helped anybody in the room today? So Father, it's in the name of your son Jesus that I thank you.